You are Locked On Kentucky, your daily podcast on the Kentucky Wildcats, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. All right, what's going on, Big Blue Nation? Welcome on in to Locked On Kentucky, your daily Kentucky Wildcats podcast. I'm your host, Lance Dahl, writer for Sports Illustrated for various SEC-related things. But on this podcast specifically, we take a dive into all things Kentucky athletics. Hey, just want to let you guys know on today's episode, we're doing something a little different. Got to sit down and talk with Chris Beesmore. Got to sit in on his podcast and talk a little Kentucky athletics. We're going to play that interview for you guys today. We talked a little bit about the Arkansas game. We talked about Kentucky's new offensive coordinator hire, which was I'll just say right here was just an absolutely phenomenal hire. And then we previewed the Ole Miss Kentucky matchup for a little bit. Uh, before we get into all of that, though, I want to tell you guys about our friends at Run Your Pool. Today's episode of Locked On Kentucky is brought to you by Run Your Pool. March Madness is here, and Run Your Pool has a better way to create your bracket. You can have, head over to runyourpool.com. It's the premier sports pool hosting service. So without further ado, let's go ahead and get into our conversation with Chris Beesmore. Welcome everyone to the Chris Beesmore Sports Podcast and we've got Lance Dahl with us today as a guest. He has his own podcast as well called Locked on Kentucky. Welcome welcome in Lance Dahl. How are you doing? I'm doing great man. How are you doing? Oh I'm doing well. I just got off of work so I'm ready to talk some UK sports with you. So all right let's let's do it. Let's get into it. So First thing first, we're going to talk about the new hire in the offensive coordinator for UK with Rich Scangarello. So what do you think about the new hire? Well, obviously, Kentucky wanted a couple different things in this first new hire. They wanted somebody that was really, really good with quarterbacks, and they wanted somebody that preferably could run Liam Cohen's scheme. They kind of wanted a seamless transition there because the personnel Kentucky has right now, really, it does benefit from a Liam Cohen tight scheme. And to be honest with you, I think they got somebody that does that perfectly. I mean, even Mark Stoops said it uh, in in the press release, said he knew he wanted to find a replacement to kind of continue what Cohen built there. And now that Kentucky has both uh, Rich and the uh, former offensive line coach, Zach Yenzer from the 49ers, I mean, they've got a couple different guys that can really, really hone in on the strengths of this Kentucky offense and really, I think, produce uh, some really good numbers uh, next season. I mean, you look at Will Levis returning. Uh, Rick Rich mentioned that he really, really liked Will Levis's skill set. He said he really liked the scheme that Kentucky's got there already. And I mean, this guy uh, has just a phenomenal track record. He's been with the 49ers. He's been with the Broncos. He's been with the Eagles. He's been with the 49ers again. He's gotten to coach some really, really good quarterbacks during his time. I wouldn't say that he's had the most elite offenses while he's been in the NFL, but I mean, all things considered, I don't think that the situations that he was placed into necessarily gave him the opportunity to have elite offenses. I mean, when you've got Drew Locke and the Denver Broncos offense, there's only so much you can do. Or, or Jimmy uh, Garoppolo right. with the 49 yeah, yeah, there's only so much you can do with Jimmy G. But uh, still, I think this was a phenomenal hire. Uh, for me, I really like the hire, too. He's been around the league for 30 years with being a graduate assistant at first. My uh, my only problem with the hire is he's known to only stay with teams for literally less than two years. So that's my only problem. I mean, Liam Cohen stayed for one year, but I think we all knew Liam Cohen wanted to stay more than one year, but, you know, had a better opportunity. And now he's the offensive coordinator for the Los Angeles Rams. But like I said, my only problem with really this hire right now is he's known to leave, uh, leave teams less than two years into uh, his coaching. Yeah, and obviously in the SEC, you're going to want to have some type of continuity. I mean, especially when you look down the road here, I mean, Texas and Oklahoma coming into the conference, a lot of things are going to be shaken up here soon. I think programs are going to want to try and solidify themselves as much as possible before that move is actually made. Um, And I think that Kentucky getting this guy, I think that's a good point. You may not necessarily have the continuity that you would like Um, But who knows? He may stick around for a little bit. Hopefully, because, I mean, we just lost our O-line coach to Alabama, Eric Wolfer. So that was not a great move. And he didn't he didn't even let the team really know that he was leaving either. So that was also, I mean, bad on his part. I mean, he should have let UK know that he was leaving. (laughs) 
Right. And I'll, I'll say this, though. I mean, there's something to be said for continuity, 100 percent. But when you look at this next season, you're going to get Georgia at home. I think that's one of the most important things you have to acknowledge heading into this season. You've got Georgia at home. You've got a ton of returning talent. The fact that you went out and got two NFL guys to hone in on your offense and make your offensive line specifically continue to play well. I think Kentucky's got a legitimate shot to win the SEC East. And look, they these two guys that they've brought over from, from the 49ers and Rich and Zach may not be here forever. And honestly, you would want guys that are here for a few years. But for this specific season, uh, I don't see, necessarily think it's a make or break year, but it's definitely a year where Kentucky could peak. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and for sure. I mean, Georgia, they lost a ton of coaches. I think they've lost five coaches in the offseason. I know they lost their either defensive or offensive coordinator in Dan Lanning. So that's a big thing. Uh, their O-line coach just resigned. He's retiring right now because he wants to spend more time with his family. So definitely in Georgia, has uh, they have a lot of new coaches coming in. So we're going to see what they can do because I feel like UK, like you said, could definitely compete with Georgia this year and could possibly win the SEC and maybe in the SEC championship game for sure. On it, honestly, I think that's a, a really good question to say, what does this Georgia team look like now that they have to make some replacements? Because something that's been said about Alabama, it's why Nick Saban's been so good is they've had so much turmoil at the coordinator spots and at the individual coaching position spots. And he's been able year in and year out to just kind of patch things up and go win another national title. So with Georgia, I think it's a really good question now that they've gotten to that point And now that they've had a couple of different guys poached and a couple of different guys retire what does that team look like can they continue to sustain success regardless of who is coaching as an offensive coordinator as a defensive coordinator as a special teams coach as an offensive line uh, coach and then can a team like Kentucky who clearly I think has the best shot to beat them this season can a team like Kentucky take advantage of what they have and I think that's going to be interesting this year yeah I mean having Will Levis as your as returning uh, starting QB, Chris Rodriguez also as a starting running back. I mean, those are two great players. And But it's sad that we lost Wondell Robinson, wide receiver, you know, one of the best yeah. wide receivers I've ever seen. Uh, and then losing a few other key players with Josh Ali, Josh Pascal on the defensive end. So we'll, we'll definitely have to see what happens uh, next year. But like I said, we have two key returns with uh, Will Levis and Chris Rodriguez. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, I, you you lose a lot in the receiver room, but when you look at the couple of guys that transferred in, I'm really excited about them. I mean, obviously, you've got Tavion Robinson. You've got another Robinson you can throw 100 balls to. Uh, I don't think he's going to be as productive as Juan Dale because he was, gosh, he was just such a special talent. But I definitely think he's going to be a guy – that's going to be looked at quite a bit by Will Levis. And then obviously Javon Baker, the transfer from Alabama. I don't know what his ceiling is, but anytime you can get a a former Alabama player on your roster, I mean, uh, I'm really excited about that. So that's a good point. Just talking about, you know, the different pieces that Kentucky has lost in the receiver room. I will say, although they may be, they may not be totally proven. I'm excited about the prospects that they have not just Will Levis and Chris Rodriguez, but obviously, uh, like I mentioned, Robinson and Baker. Then you've got a couple of new guys coming in like Barry and Brown, the freshman. I'm excited to see what he can do. Uh, there's a lot of different really good recruits that I think can also contribute early. And then going back to talking about the offensive line for a second, the tackles are what concern me. But I think Keonta Goodwin, the five star kid. I mean, with these two NFL guys, they've got to be able to find him playing time. I'm just excited about this offense, man. Yeah, so am I. Like like you said, we have a lot of recruits coming in on the wide receiver with Barry and Brown, Jordan Anthony, a uh, couple of other wide receivers. But like you said, losing our offensive team uh, with our tackles with Darren Kennard and uh, what was the guy from Ole Miss? I uh, can't think of his name, the Ole Miss transfer. I can't remember his name either. Didn't we have a uh, transfer from LSU as well, or is he still here? Uh I'm not is sure. Rosenthal still here? Yeah. Uh, Derek Rosenthal, I think he uh, left for the draft. I'm pretty, okay. I'm pretty sure that's who I'm thinking of. I was thinking of, I think, Jockess Jones, the offensive. Or oh, the that's Ole right. Miss, the Ole Miss guy, I think. Yeah. Yeah, for defense. My bad. I got the players confused on that. But, uh, but all right. So let's start talking about our next topic and recapping the UK-Arkansas game that happened uh, on Saturday. And, wow, what a bump 
want to bone waltz, right? <laughs> yeah, I mean, all things considered, you know, the 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 best strategy is not to let your opponent have a fifteen nothing run. Uh, at the very beginning of the game. I mean, that's ideally it's not going to win you a lot of basketball games. So let me tell you something about this Kentucky team. Like these past several games, they have really struggled early, but they've managed to come back and they've went, managed to win just about all of them outside of that Tennessee game on yeah. the road in Knoxville. I think that they're setting themselves up to play really well at the beginning of the NCAA tournament and make a legitimate run to the Elite Eight, even if their guards aren't 100% healthy. We've seen them battle back against legitimate competition. Alabama, LSU, Arkansas, just this past game. I'll say that while it was a disappointing loss, and we can go into detail about some of the some of the things that, that happened, um, mm -hmm. overall, just my initial impression was I'm proud of the way that this team played. Uh, despite uh, some of their injuries, and I think they're playing well right now still. Yeah, I mean, like you said, we, start, we started the game down 15-2 to two at one point. Nobody could get their shots going. Uh, Kellen Grady got into uh, early foul trouble. And one thing that really made me mad after the game, people were like, man, Arkansas really planned very well out for uh, Kellen Grady. But honestly, the shots weren't falling early. Kellen Grady was in foul trouble. And the only thing that we could do was get the ball down low to Oscar Sheebway. I mean, luckily for him, he kept us in the game scoring 30, 30 points and 18 rebounds. But, I mean, they didn't really game, game plan around Kellen Grady too much because I saw there were times that he was wide open for a three in the second half and we just didn't get the ball to him because our shots weren't falling, obviously. I mean, let's see, what did we shoot from the three-point line? Uh. It was something, it was like 4 of 15 or something abysmal. Yeah, I don't have it pulled up exactly, but yeah, we shot terrible from the three-point line. I mean, what can you do? Get the ball down low to Oscar, let him uh, let him go to work, and that's what we did, and he kept us in the game. Yeah, absolutely. I think, yeah, I thought that Arkansas was going to have an easier time guarding uh, Shibwe in Kentucky's front court. I thought Jalen Williams was going to be more of a factor defensively, but Shibwe um, has really turned it up a notch, I think, over these past couple of games. Just incredibly physical on the glass. He's playing good defense as well. I think he picked up uh, a couple of blocks in this game. I might be mistaken. No, he picked up three. Uh, actually, I'm looking at the stat sheet here. Um, he's been playing very well on both ends of the floor and just phenomenal post moves. Um, from Oscar Shibwe. the Kentucky did shoot four of 15 from three. And to go back to what you were saying about Kellen Grady, I mean, there are two guys on this offense that I think can really, really turn it up. And the other guys can score well, but they can't turn it up as consistently as these two guys. It's Oscar, Oscar Shibwe and Kellen Grady. When you bring in a guy that has scored 2,000 points at another program, you would like to think that you could get him the ball as much as possible outside of your national player of the year. The, Kentucky has got to find ways to get Kellen Grady more open shots because he can knock them down mm -hmm. he really is that good and I think coach Cal has complained a little bit about Grady being a little gun shy at times this season look he's got to be able to shake that off he's got to be able to really really start to get hot here as the as the postseason gets near um, mm -hmm. because he could be a really valuable asset in March mm -hmm. and I agree and many people people uh, many people were complaining about Keon Brooks at the end of the game but honestly Keon was the set, tied for the second leading scorer with Xavier Williams, or not Xavier Williams, Xavier Wheeler with 14 points. So, I mean, both of them scored 14 points. And usually if you have a player who scored 30 points and two other players to score 14 points, that usually equates to a win, right? <laughs> right. And I'll, I'll say this about Keon. Um, there, there were a lot of people that were upset with either his defensive performance or his offensive performance or whatever it may, may have been yesterday. But I mean, he shot seven of 13 from the field, uh, all things considered that's above 50%. I'll take that. Um, he finished with a couple of steals as well. The foul call at the very end of the game, the push off um, that he was called for that kind of cost. That was, that was the nail in the coffin that cost Kentucky the game at the very end there. I mean, you can say what you want about that. That's a dumb, that's a dumb mistake. It happens. Um, was it the right call? I don't know. I feel like the Arkansas player sold it well, but uh -huh. I, I am, I've been on and off this season 
really, really hard on Keon Brooks because statistically the two-point jumper is not the most efficient shot on the planet. But if he's knocking it down as much as he does, then why wouldn't we let him take it? Why wouldn't we uh, add that to our offense, make it more difficult to guard? So, I mean, Keon's unique. Um, and he has his he has his quirks, he has his strengths, he has his weaknesses. But, ov- but overall, I'm still glad that he's playing for us, and I think that he's playing well. I'll say that. I don't think yeah. he's playing bad. Yeah, I think he's playing well, too. I mean, his best game for sure at Kentucky was Kentucky versus Kansas at Kansas when he went off for, what, 28 points? I mean, it was an insane amount. But, yeah, I'm the same way as he. Whenever I see him shoot that, shoots, he shoots a long-range, uh, long mid-range jump shot. I'm like, I hate that shot. And then it goes down. I'm like, never mind. I don't hate it. <laughs> yeah. So early on in the season, I I just started doing this locked on Kentucky podcast last November. So I I, I this basketball season had just started. And so I kind of made a joke early that I was like, Keon Brooks is the king of the two point jumper. And there's no other, there's no other king. And then jokingly at one point, I was like, I think Ty Ty's taken over that spot. And then after the Kansas game, I'm like, I will never doubt you again. You are the king of the two point jumper. Uh-huh. Once and for all. Mm-hmm. And I'll say this just overall about the shot. Wheeler taking as many shots as he did, I, I didn't think was good. Keon Brooks taking a ton of two-point jumpers. He's the one that makes them more often than not. But I mean, the team as a as a whole, they just don't they don't make that shot a whole lot. And then Ty Ty Washington, since his injury, he's been just completely off. Mm-hmm. Um, he any shot that he takes, I'm afraid is and this is not meant to be incredibly rude. Any shot he takes, I don't expect to go down because he's just not been the same. Yeah, uh, and I don't really know what to attribute it to. I've got a statistic here for you. Through the Kansas game on January 29th, Kentucky was hitting 39% from mid-range on the season. That's about 90th in the country. Since that k- game, Kentucky is hitting 30% from mid-range, which is 340th in the country. And not only that, Kentucky has increased their percentage of mid-range shots taken from 36% to 40%. So they're taking more mid-range jumpers since that Kansas game, and they're hitting significantly less. You've got to be able to adjust a little bit here heading down the stretch. You've got to find some more consistent offense and better shot selection. And I think a part of that is, too, with having Savir and Tai Tai both out for UK, you don't you don't really have any ball hand, ball handling for you to be able to attack the rim or take yep. someone off the dribble. But I think if they can get back healthy for UK, I think UK can definitely be a title run team for sure uh, this coming up year because, like I said, once you get Savir and Tai Tai back, being fully conditioned, being able to play a full 40 minutes in college ball, because whenever I played just regular basketball, I'm winded after like five or six minutes. So I just feel like they're winded right now because of their yeah. injuries. But once they get fully healthy, I think UK will definitely be a title contending team. Yeah, I mean, when it, before these two guys really, really uh, suffered uh, suffered injuries that feel like they've kind of lingered here for several games now, this was a really, really talented team, and they still are, don't get me wrong. I just, they play their best brand of basketball when those two guys are healthy. When you're, and that's kind of, that's not, that's not a hot take or anything. It's just saying when my starting backcourt is healthy, my team plays the best. I mean, it's just kind of a, it's just kind of a given, right? So I really, really hope that Cal manages their minutes well here over these final uh, few games, the, the two games against one against Ole Miss, one against Florida, and then hopefully several in the SEC tournament. Um, I really hope that, that hopefully, fingers crossed. Um, I really hope that, uh, they kind of start to to light a spark within themselves in this offense, but very similar to Grady. We just simply need better guard play overall is what I keep coming back to. And one last thing about the Kentucky-Arkansas uh, game. I thought the turning point was whenever Safir Wheeler went up for a layup or a mid-range jump shot, I forgot, and he got his own rebound, but he was trying not to get a trap call, and he passed it out, and then the ball went out of bounds by Kellen Grady caught the ball and he was pushed a little bit but the refs didn't call it but I think that was the turning point I think during the game uh Kentucky was up one at that point and then I thought it was all Arkansas after that in my opinion yeah there were go ahead I don't don't know if you remember that play specifically there were certain there were certain points in the second half where it was like okay that's that was a that was a moment where we could have capitalized because the game was back and forth and back and forth and back and forth and 
there were moments in the second half where we could have capitalized and extended the lead to double digits or, in, or excuse me, let me phrase not to double digits to like a four or five points uh, double or like two possessions yeah. is what I'm trying to say. And we couldn't, we couldn't take advantage. And there were a couple of turnovers uh, where, where I believe there were, there was that one, right. Where, where Grady had stepped out of bounds mm-hmm. um, and there were moments where there, it was just simply that like you could look at it and be like, that was costly. Um, I will say, though, I mean, the environment was obviously a factor. Playing on the road was a factor. Not a lot of teams in the SEC are winning on the road. I believe the top four teams in the SEC are 64 and one at home. And the one loss was actually Arkansas uh, at home against Vanderbilt. But still, like, it's very tough to win in Bud Walton Arena. This team in Arkansas is very, very hot. I'm just I'm just proud that Kentucky, despite all of the woes that they have right now, and despite not playing their best basketball, it was a two point game at the end of the day. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and then uh, obviously Arkansas, JT Note went off for uh, Arkansas. He had 30 points and eight assists. So, I mean, he had an incredible game. So, I mean, can both uh, both players keep that up, though, with Oscar Shibwe and Oscar or JT, JD Note if they uh, meet up in the SEC uh, tournament or maybe the NCAA tournament? I mean, those players had an insane game for, you know. Man. That would be really fun to see them in like an elite eight matchup. Oh, I, would, I can I can definitely see that. I wouldn't want an elite eight matchup for sure. I remember uh, during the game, one of the announcers they were like, "Man, this game feels like an feels like a final four matchup." I'm like, I'm thinking to myself, maybe not a final four, but definitely an elite eight or a sweet sixteen game. I feel like. Yeah, I'll say I'll say this. It's like. Well, thankfully, the Final Four is not being being played in Bud Walton Arena. Otherwise, we would have some problems. I'm very thankful that we get neutral site uh, in the SEC tournament and the NCAA tournament. I think this team is really – I think the crowd – like, you look at the LSU and Tennessee games as well. Not having a crowd that affects you, I think, is really going to help this team moving forward. Mm-hmm. All right. And then let's finally start talking about Kentucky versus Ole Miss. I mean, the game is tomorrow. Uh I think Kentucky will definitely win this with the uh, Ole Miss record. Uh, the Ole Miss record right now, they are 13 and 16 on the season, so they are under 500. So I think Kentucky should win this game for sure. Yeah, I think this is a little bit of a clash of offensive styles or just overall in terms of pace. These two teams play very differently. Ole Miss, one of the slower teams in the conference. They also don't really score a whole lot, like to play a little bit of defense. Kentucky loves to push the ball in transition when they can. They like to play up tempo. They like to cause a little havoc. I think these two teams are very different. One of the things that I'm going to be looking out for is to see more consistent guard play from the Wildcats. I think they're going to be able to get it. I don't think this is a great matchup for Ole Miss. Um, You look at what they're scoring right now, only 68 points a game and 67 in conference play. They've been hindered by by injuries at at points this season, and they've officially lost their guard, Sean Ruffin, for the rest of the season. Um, So that's going to be, I think, a, a huge point. Uh, for Ole Miss in this game is just defensively not having as many guys as they could to potentially pressure Kentucky's guards and then vice versa. Um, so I think that this is a game that Kentucky can definitely definitely win. On uh, Whenever I do preview and recap shows, I have four parameters that I like to set for Kentucky wins, specifically on the road in the SEC, but just like four things that they have to do well to win the game. And it, it's just not like end-all, be-all. It's just like Let's see if they check some of the boxes. I say that Kentucky needs to shoot the ball well. They need to have decent shot selection. They need to play well in transition, both offensively and defensively. And then they need to protect the rim. And if they can do all four of those things, then most likely they're going to win the game. I think Kentucky, if they have decent shot selection, they should not be rushed by Mm -hmm. Ole Miss. If they have decent shot selection, they're going to shoot the ball well. I think Oscar Shibway could have another phenomenal day uh, in, in, in this game. And then, also playing well in transition, I think Kentucky at home can really push the pace whenever they want to. I can see Kentucky having 10 more fast break points in Ole Miss in this game. So I think they check the box there and then protecting the rim. Ole Miss can't shoot worth a rip right now. They're underneath the national average, I think, in two-point percentage, three-point percentage, effective field goal percentage, turnover percentage, and block percentage. And that's not me being dramatic. I actually just went and looked at Ken Palm a little bit ago. And it's just like, oh, they stink at everything offensively. So I think that Kentucky is going to have their way. Say it again? Yeah, they're not good. Georgia basketball only winning one SEC game so far. Oh my! <laughs> yeah, they are. Uh, they're they're not very good, man. It's very it's similar. It's similar to Georgia basketball and what Tom Crean's got going on. But yeah, 
I see Kentucky winning this game. I don't know what the spread is. I don't know what the Ken Palm prediction is, but whatever it is, I'm taking Kentucky to cover likely, barring some collective meltdown and barring the Kentucky opponent doing what most Kentucky opponents have actually done coming into Rupp, which is shoot the lights out for about the first 10 minutes of the game. Uh, it always happens. And then they just revert back to average. It's just like, could we not? Like, yeah. could we just win, please? Yeah. Uh, I'm trying to see if I can find the betting odds for that because I feel like UK will win by a good amount, maybe like eight or nine points at least for sure, in my opinion. Uh, Ken Palm says Kentucky wins 80 to 62. 80 to 62. So I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. And I don't know what the I don't know what the line is, but yeah, I'm trying to see if I can find this line. Uh Kentucky versus Ole Miss. No, that's not it. Yeah, I'm having no luck trying to find this right now. So I'll just I'll say this ten and a half. Do you, would you take Kentucky to cover? I think Kentucky would cover for sure ten and a half. I mean I would I I would take I, I know that the Wildcats have been iffy at home at times this season, just as far as like they've won, but they've not been like consistent to like what the numbers would say i would take kentucky to, to cover in this game yeah if wheeler has a good good night for sure i think they should because i feel like this will be more of a tune-up game like last year whenever kentucky played south carolina in their final game of the year where they, where davion mintz went crazy i mean how many threes did he make last year against south carolina like seven it was something it was something yeah it was something ridiculous like yeah. seven or six yeah I've, I feel like uh, these next two games for UK could potentially be tune-up games with Ole Miss and Florida. So we'll just have to see what happens with that because I feel confident UK will definitely win tomorrow. Uh, like you said, I feel like they'll cover 10 and a half, in my opinion. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think that this is one of the, yeah, that's a good point just as far as like looking down the line, postseason talk for a second. I think these are two really good uh tune-up games because you look at what some of the other teams are having to deal with i mean i think arkansas has a really rough go at the end of the season yeah they play lsu and tennessee uh auburn who has been falling apart on the road recently still has to play mississippi state play south carolina who is i think trying to vie for a bubble spot right now if they can pick up a win uh pick up a legitimate win carolina won't yeah i feel like south carolina won't make it but hey hey I've seen I've seen crazier things with Auburn and then Tennessee plays at Georgia. Who cares? And then they do play Arkansas to end this season. Uh, Alabama playing Texas A&M and ASU or uh, LSU. I mean, all things considered, this is a relatively easy end to the season, what I'm trying to say. Yeah. And so going back to what I was saying about guard play, if if Wheeler, Grady um, and, and Mintz and Washington can all start to play more efficient basketball and then play well in the SEC tournament. I think this team is primed to make a legitimate Final Four run or a national title run. I I feel that for sure. Right now, I I'm thinking we could possibly be an elite eight Final Four team. I could be wrong. I want them to obviously win the national championship, but right now I feel like we're a solid elite eight Final Four team. My only problem is we just don't have a solid backup big. I mean, yeah, we have Lance Ware, and he's actually been playing phenomenal the past couple games. I mean, he didn't really play too much against Arkansas. I don't know even if he did play because Oscar was just going insane last game. I think he, I think he played a couple of minutes, but I, I remember talking about this on, on yesterday's show. Um, I, I noted that like Collins, Ware, and Hopkins played a collective four minutes and they recorded one statistic and Ware grabbed a rebound and that was it. Mm-hmm. That was literally it. Uh, Cal did not want to use his bench against the Razorbacks. And yeah. I kind of understand it, but also, like, you're right. Kentucky does not have a backup big that is, like, mm-hmm. as good as you would like to have at this point in the season. Yeah. I mean, we always had, like, Nick Richards as a backup center. Not, you know, not two years ago. He was obviously the starting center. But whenever we had Reed Travis and P.J. Washington at the four and the five, you had mm-hmm. Richards and E.J. Montgomery, two off the bench, which, they weren't as consistent as you needed them to be, but they were still pretty great, you know, backup bigs whenever you needed them. Yeah, absolutely. And I'll say this about Lance where um, he, while he may not be the greatest backup center in the world, I mean, he plays with a lot of heart. He's obviously fighting his tail off out there. And I, I love the energy that he brings. So do I. Uh, but like I said, I think the downfall for UK could possibly just be, they don't have a lot of three-point shooters. I mean, yeah, they have Kellen Grady, who can shoot, uh, Davion Mintz, who can shoot, but 
you notice Ty Ty, uh, Ty Ty Washington, he usually only shoots mid-range shots, you know. He doesn't really shoot the three balls. Javier isn't the best three-point shooter. Keon only shoots mid-range shots. And then Jacob Toppin, he's too afraid to shoot behind the three-point line. <laughs> so yeah. that's that's my only fear, definitely going to postseason, because I'm afraid what will happen is people will back off of Savir like they did in the Notre Dame game, six feet or so, and then just clog the paint, and then hopefully UK will be able to make their you know threes or long mid-range jump shots. Yeah, you got to be able to make your shots here down the stretch. You've got to be able to prove that you have a little bit of an outside threat. And it's not just Grady. I will say Grady's probably the most important player to get going because he is the most consistent. But you've got to be able to show here down the stretch. Okay, Ty Ty Washington's gotten a little bit better. Davion Mintz, we know he's a shooter. He's in a little bit of a slump right now. Can we get him out of that funk? And then, I mean, Wheeler... He's not the best shoot, shooter in the world, but if he can start hitting at like a 30 to 35% clip, I mean, people are really going to have to adjust and it's going to make the offense flow a lot better. Yeah, like I said, I think in postseason play, in my opinion, I think a lot of teams will try to clog the paint on Oscar and just hope UK will miss their shots, you know? Yeah. But all right, I think that's all we have to talk about today. I appreciate your time. Uh, I appreciate you joining me as a guest, and I appreciate us talking about everything with Kentucky's new offensive coordinator, uh, talking about the previous game and then this upcoming game uh, tomorrow. So Yeah, man. I, right, I appreciate so, it. Thank you so much for having me on. You're welcome. So let's say final score for tomorrow. Oh, gosh. Okay. Uh, the question is always kind of for me in the back of my head whenever I, I predict is like, will Kentucky hit 80? Cause that's floating up right about their average. I'll say 83 to I'll say 83 to 71. Mm-hmm. I'll say 83, 71. I was thinking 80 to 68 UK. Okay. There you go. So, I mean, we both thought in the eighties, right? <laughs> yeah. Eighties right. and, and uh, high, high sixties, low seventies. There you go. Yeah. All right. Sounds good. Well, like I said, I appreciate your time, man. Yeah. Thank you so much again for having me on, man. All right. You're welcome. All right. So there you have it. Got to have a conversation with Chris Beesmore. Would really appreciate it if you guys went and uh, went over to Instagram and followed his Instagram page if you're not following him already. He's got 32,000 followers at UK Videos on Instagram. Would really appreciate it if you guys went and gave him a follow over there on the socials. I'll also leave links to his YouTube channel in the description of both the podcast and the YouTube episode uh, for today. That's going to do it for today's episode of Locked On Kentucky. You can follow the show on Twitter at Locked On UK. You can follow me on Twitter at Lance Daw underscore, and you can follow the show on Instagram at Kentucky Podcast. We will be back tomorrow to recap Kentucky basketball's game with the Ole Miss Rebels. Have a good day, everybody, and God bless.